Good evening, I'm Nisa Petrilli. I'm Jay Kaplan. I'm Steve Ferguson. And I'm Sean Roman. And this is On the Sports Lines for October 2nd, 2014. October brings playoff baseball, week five of the NFL, and the end of an era that lasted two decades. Tonight, we dive into the four division series, talk Jets and Giants, and pay a final tribute to the captain. As always, we want to hear from you, so email us at fanspeak at onthesportslines.com, send your tweets to at onthesportslines, and your posts to facebook.com slash onthesportslines. We just may read them on the show. Do I really need to say it, Sean? Do I? <laughs> really? <laughs> Well, the 2-2 two and two Giants, coming off an impressive 45-14 win on the road at Washington, are home to face the 2-2 two and two Falcons, who are coming off a surprising 41-28 loss to the Vikings. Steve, give me a storyline, matchup, or player to watch. Well, my storyline is this. Can the Giants apply any pressure to disrupt <laughs> Matt Ryan? And there's a reason why he's called Matty Ice. This guy, when he has time to throw, is about as controlled and as good as anybody you'll see. And I've seen stretches where he'll go 10 for 10, 12 for 12. They have to get pressure on him. Jason Pierre, Paul, and company have to come after this guy or he'll pick them apart. Fair enough. Uh, I'm looking at actually at the guys he's going to be throwing to, and mm. that will be Mr. Roddy White and uh, Mr. Drew Julio Jones. Oh. And the matchup they will have with a suddenly very much improving Giants secondary. True. Uh, Jones leads the league with 447 yards receiving. White's always formidable. The Giants secondary over the last two weeks after the, the opening two losses. Mm -hmm. Now, granted, they're not quite the second coming of the Legion of Boom, <laughs> but... Uh, in the wins against Houston and Washington, seven interceptions, eight turnovers forced, held Andre Johnson to 24 yards receiving, held Deshaun Amazing. Jackson to one catch for nine yards. Dominic rogers Cromarty, when he is on, is a legitimate shutdown corner. He is. Takes the you know, opposition's number one receiver out of the game. Prince of Mukamara is coming on. He's yeah. definitely coming into his own as a cover corner. Already has two picks this year. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I was concerned, I think I said this to you on the last show, about mm -hmm. Walter Thurman going down. But yes. Jermaine McBride has done a nice job stepping right in as the third cornerback. Uh, to me, the matchup between DRC and Julio Jones and between Prince and Roddy White is where the action will be, and those matchups will determine the outcome of this game. I Look agree. at you two guys. The focus is actually on the field and away from the commissioner. Exactly. We're about all that right <laughs> so now. give us yours. Yes. Well, I'm focusing on Eli Manning, but where do you think he's going to be focused on this weekend? A tight end, maybe? Uh, yes. No, he's going to be watching the Alabama Ole Miss game. All right. Game. Uh, that's a okay. Saturday, yes. yes. He's been quoted that's right. nationwide on that one. <laughs> he would go if there was a bye week. <laughs> Eli Manning, the Giants are extraordinarily loyal and fortunate mm -hmm. to have Eli mm -hmm. Manning. No matter what everybody across the country says, oh, the interceptions, he's not at the level of the other guys. The Giants are like, you know, we're happy. We're probably going to get another Super Bowl out of this, and they like it. One horrible game against Matthew Stafford and the Lions in Detroit. Mm -hmm. Three very good games after that. In the second game against Arizona, his receivers let him down. But the next two games, the offense has just really clicked. And tell me this, and I, I have to do this every so often. I have to compare these weird things about Eli. <laughs> Who else in the entire league makes a superstar out of a backup tight end that we have never once in years on this show analyzing both New York teams mm -hmm. ever even mentioned? <laughs> ah, <laughs> now, to be fair, yes. Joe Tafaro, my co-host in Blue and Green Review on our spring <laughs> training show, Threw out Larry Donald's Larry name. Donald. And every time Donald has a big game, he tweets me, did somebody mention Larry Donald? <laughs> that, that's a good point. Very yes, esoteric, that's but right. Very true. Right. So Eli Manning has that weird ability to like pick out a guy from Grambling mm -hmm. yes. and who's been unemployed and make him a superstar <laughs> and an yeah. asshole. I mean, I am very impressed with him. But a lot of the credit goes to his the offensive line, yes. which is really regrouping on the Giants. They, yes. they played Give very well. Give Eli a chance and watch the numbers he puts up. He's second to none in the league. There you go. Mm -hmm. True. 
Well, the one in three New York Jets, coming off a 24 to 17 home loss to the Lions, look to snap their three-game losing streak on the road as they visit the three and one Chargers, who easily defeated the Jaguars 33 to 14. Sean, give me a key storyline, a player matchup to watch in this game. I'm going to stick with the quarterback in a very similar line because the Jets have been unfortunate in the mm -hmm. respect that mm -hmm. in generations of watching them since, what, maybe 40 years now, they haven't had a guy like Eli Manning who has owned the position for 10 years mm -hmm. or a guy no. like Phil Simms who owned it for almost 10 years. Right. What is the problem there? Now, we have a good body of work for Geno Smith, and he is underwhelming. 20 games in so far, and he doesn't show a great control of the position. No. He looks like, you know, it's just another... Difficult quarterback situation for the Jets, and he's not the type of person. I mean, he brought in some great numbers from West Virginia, breaking records. There you go. But he just did not bring that pizzazz to the NFL. And one and four is a point that is a hole that he's not going to be able to dig himself out of. So after that, this is make or break right here for Geno Smith. Very difficult challenge. Two and three is a lot better for one and four. One or four, I just don't see him with the confidence to come back from that. Make or break, huge game coming up this weekend. Uh, I got to agree with you. And mm. if his comments after the loss are any indication, he's not maintaining... Eli-esque poise and cool under pressure, no. which you need in this media market. <laughs> yes, what do. I'm going to be looking at in this game is a guy who <laughs> could be, and if Marty Morinwig has his head on straight, should be the X Factor, and that's Jason Morrow. They drafted this guy thinking he yeah. would give them what Antonio Gates gives Ex Philip Rivers, exactly. which we will see plenty of in this game. Oh, yeah. So, I mean, this guy's a receiving threat. He's a matchup nightmare. Why is he only averaging 20-odd snaps a game? Why is Jeff Cumberland, who is not a receiving threat, averaging getting 50 snaps in a game against the Lions? Okay, now finally, in the game against the Lions, Amaro got five catches for 58 yards. Four of those came in the second half, which makes me wonder, what the heck has Morton Wegg been smoking that it's taken him this long <laughs> to figure out? you got to put that, right. give that guy in position to make plays, especially against a team like Detroit, which has safety issues. Now, granted, okay, Marcus Gilchrist and Eric Weddle are a decent safety combination, mm -hmm. but you still, you got to get Amaro involved, get the guy the ball, Excellent playmaker, good solid run after the catch ability. He can open up the middle of the field. It's a dimension this offense needs, and they got to figure out a way to make more use of him. Well, for me, I'm going to be looking at Keenan Allen, and the San Diego receiving core is unbelievable. Yeah. And you give Phillip Rivers any time to throw these guys, and he'll take the, take the Jets apart. Because, first of all, we all know the Jets' <laughs> secondary is about as weak as it gets. Yep. D. Milliner is coming mm. back. That will help them a little bit. But the question, you hope. We hope. Yeah, I should say we hope. <laughs> but Keenan Allen is becoming a major superstar. When you have Antonio Gates, who already is and mm -hmm. still plays at an extremely high level, you add that to Keenan Allen, who's probably their fastest receiver, the Jets could have a very long day unless they figure out a way to stop at least one of those receivers. Yeah, and with San Diego's run, both their running backs uh, banked yeah. up, they're going to be somewhat of a one-dimensional team. True. We will see. The Jets are going to need to generate some pass rush or yes. else that secondary is going to get exposed. Yeah. If, Rivers, if Rivers will throws take, the ball 40 times. Oh, he'll take them apart if they don't get to him. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, let's talk a little MLB. Sure. Okay. Baseball's four divisional round series are <clears throat> underway. In the American League, the Angels take on the Royals, while the Orioles take on the Tigers. In the National League, the Dodgers play the Cardinals, while the Nationals play the Giants. We're going to do this lightning round style. One analyst, one series, one player under the microscope. Sean, you're up first. Dodgers versus Cardinals. Which player is under the microscope? Clayton Kershaw. Mm. Mm. The ace of aces right now. A guy who reminds you of Ron Guidry type numbers in 1978 when I think he was like 25, 25 and 3. And three. With a 1.78. Yes. 10 years after that, David Cohn when he went 20 and 3. 3. 2.22. Just yeah. phenomenal Doc Goodman. years. Doc Goodman. Yeah. Yeah. Just these four. special yeah. years. Mm -hmm. ERA. But Clayton Kershaw, it's not like he's a rookie. He's pitched about seven seasons now. He's been in the playoffs three times already, and he has put up very pedestrian numbers in the postseason. What's his record? Jay, do you know that? Actually, not off the top of my head, but I believe he has a losing record. A phenomenal one and three. Yeah, he's won one game. You know, I mean, like, wow. uh, yeah. last year, I think he picked up, uh, he dropped two against St. Louis and won a decision against Atlanta. Uh, 4.23 ERA, 38 innings pitch, 21 runs, 33 hits. Very not very good. Yeah. That's, yeah, that's why I like say him. the spotlight is on Clayton <coughs> Kershaw. And before we go, did you guys watch that game that went into the middle of the night with the Royals? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah, absolutely. 
One great of the game. best. Tremendous game. Mm -hmm. well, so, Steve, it's your turn. Nationals versus Giants. Which player is under the microscope? You know, I'm going to be looking at Ryan Zimmerman, and, hmm. I, and I realize that I'm going to have a little controversy yeah. bringing his name up. No, I don't think that. Ryan Zimmerman has always been and still is, even though you hear about Strasburg and you hear about uh, Harper. Harper, he's the face of this franchise. And granted, he's been hurt a lot of the year, but what this guy can do for this team is a couple of things. Even though his throwing arm isn't as good as it once was, he's been the third baseman, he plays the outfield, and he can also play first base. How does he affect them? Well, the Nationals are in so many close ball games, they may mm. need him not only off the bench, they may need him to start against perhaps Bumgarner or per come into a game against one of their tough lefties like Javier Lopez. And one thing he really is... Or is Lincecum. A, or, yeah, or Lincecum, who oh, actually yeah. may come no in about to relieve... He's a really good clutch hitter and clutch performer, and I think you'll see him have a significant role at some point in the series. I think that's a solid pick. Well seen. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Well, Jay, Angels, Royals, which player's under the microscope there? <laughs> Mike Trout. Come on now. <laughs> <laughs> First time in the postseason. Right. Best player in baseball yeah. needs to step up on baseball's biggest Agreed. stage. Now, granted, they have the likes of, you've talked about this lineup, Steve. Albert oh, Pujols, yes. Howie Kendrick, Josh Hamilton. Even Ivar. former World Series MVP David Freeze yep. is in this lineup. That's they all right. have extensive postseason experience, have yep. carried their teams. Trout's going to be the guy everybody's looking at. Yep. He hit 409, three homers, four RBI in the six regular season games. The Angels played against the Royals, but the team only went 3-3. Three and three. How's that going to translate in this divisional matchup? Trout's won Rookie of the Year, been runner-up for the AL MVP twice. twice. He is the prevailing opinion is this year he will finally take home yeah, that cup award. Time he gets it. Textbook definition of a 5-2 player. The next step for him is to showcase his skills in the postseason where the pressure increases a thousandfold and it starts with this series. Sure. Microscope yep. squarely on. Very true. Yep. Well, for my turn, the Tigers and Orioles, I'm going to change it up a little and go with a manager. <laughs> uh, Buck ah, Showalter yes. is under the microscope. I think um, so. He's managed the most games of any manager who's never been to the World Series. Mm -hmm. um, 2,400 change, I believe. Yeah, wow. it's a lot. That's and a each lot. of the franchises that he previously managed, as you guys know, went on to have huge postseason success after, after he left. After right. he left. So right. this guy's yes. definitely got something to prove, so I think he's definitely under the microscope. And I think he has the potential to win it all with this team. I think this is the best team yes. that he's ever managed. Mm -hmm. um, and, mm -hmm. and if he can keep motivating them like he's done all season, I think they actually could go all the way. A stiff test against I think the they Tigers, could. though. Yep, that's very true. Yes. Well, after 20 years in pinstripes, Derek Jeter, the captain of the New York Yankees, is calling it a career. R.J. Kaplan finished up the fan interviews he started at Yankee Stadium and then went out to Miller's Ale House in Levittown to get a few more. Here's part two of our tribute to the captain. Part two of our tribute to the captain, Derek Jeter, took us from the big ball yard in the South Bronx, otherwise known as the house that Jeter built, to the best sports bar in Levittown, Long Island, Miller's Ale House. What is, in your mind, the signature Derek Jeter moment? When he dove into the stands and caught that ball in the playoffs, best, by far, best moment. I was sitting here at the, dug at the Yankee dugout. My wife bought me tickets on a special day, and Derek Jeter went over playing the Red Sox. Uh -huh. It was great. Is the flip the signature Derek Jeter moment? Absolutely. I've never seen anybody uh, so out of position and such an awkward, it just, I don't even know how to describe that play, but uh, it's probably the best play I've ever seen. Unexpected. In a live yeah. baseball game. Of course, he's going to tell us straight off the cuff that it's like he practiced that in spring training. Well, I was fortunate enough to be at the, the game where he hit his 3,000 hit, but a milestone for him as well as uh, it was for me. Well, it had to be the 2,000 Subway Series. Okay. You know, um, it was game four. The Mets had won game three. You think they're right back in the series. And on uh, one swing of the bat, Derek Jeter, you know, hits one over the left field fence. The Yankees took all the momentum away. Best playoff performer ever in Yankee history? Of course, without yeah. a doubt, best, best playoff performer. No, I think Yogi was. Yeah? yeah? Okay, tell me why. Well, he's got 10 World Series rings. All right, so you give that, that right there, right? That, that, that sets it for That's you. That's a pretty good answer. I'd say no. No? Yeah. You're going to give the nod to Reggie on that one? Probably, yeah. Pantheon of all-time Yankee greats, where do you put him? I put him right after probably Babe Ruth and Mickey Mantle. Yeah, I put him up there with Don Manley, even though Manley never won mm -hmm. the championships. In your mind, first ballot Hall of Famer? Absolutely, tell me why. Oh, you know, on the field, you know, he's got the number speak for itself, 3,000 hits, all the all-star performances, World Series championships, you know, it makes the team better, you know. It's more than just the numbers, it's also the intangibles as well. Uh, he's probably the most influential baseball player in like modern era. Oh God, yeah. Yeah, all right, Absolutely. tell me why. Uh, because of uh, how he plays the game. Uh, he plays it very well. Uh, he's good at what he does. 
and he sleeps it, eats it, and drinks it. Absolutely. Tell me why. Because he just outperforms everybody else that's out there right now. What's the legacy he's going to leave behind? Probably the best player with the least problems. He was uh, in the press for dating beautiful actresses and singers <laughs> and not for uh, bad things. Clean baseball. Yeah, being a leader, mm -hmm. being that guy that you could bring down and you could say that is who you want to be when you're old. I think the fact that he's a winner. I think you could even, you know, somebody like Tori, you look up to him. He's a leader for his teammates, for the fans. Again, you know, for kids to look up to. He's not a guy that's going out and getting in trouble outside the game. He's just, he's just a, a baseball player, good person, winner, you know, in everything that he did. I think he's one of the few ball players who was able to show kids, and as, as well as adults, what the game is about and how it should be approached. He leaves behind one of the greatest championship legacies around, and he leaves behind two more important things. One, doing everything the right way mm -hmm. in a very, very steroid-laden era, and just professionalism on and off the field. I've always said on the show, Derek Jeter understood the meaning of the sign up on the clubhouse wall. I thank the good Lord for making me a Yankee. That's a Joe DiMaggio quote. Jeter slaps it every time before he goes on the field. He gets it. Great stuff, Jay. Thank you. Well, it is time now for our guys to weigh in on three of the questions that Jay asked the fans at Miller's Ale House. Steve, is Derek Jeter a first ballot Hall of Famer? Well, even though I'm the huge resident Met fan, oh, yeah, the biggest one. without uh. question, <laughs> yes, he is. And why? Because look at all the things he's done in his career. 3,456 hits, plus 300 That's hitter one, in really. the postseason. The amazing plays against the A's and the Red Sox in the postseason. Um, his team only missed the playoffs twice in his 20-year career, which yep. is incredible. And he's the leading Yankee hitter. The most hits in their history, he has them. And talk about a class act, dignified, upfront, and about as good as, as you'll ever get. No question in my mind, that man is a first bout Hall of Famer. Uh, I'll give you another stat, and this okay. kind of nails it for me. I read this recently. Mm -hmm. If you measure guys based purely on wins and losses in the games they played, Derek Jeter has the highest winning percentage of anybody in baseball history. Wow. He is tops. He is plus 500 <laughs> wins and losses. Wow. Awesome. That's crazy. Mm -hmm. that is, that's I incredible. didn't know, I didn't know that. Yep. Um, Sean, what's the legacy that Jeter leaves behind? Now, what you're saying is like with the Hall of Fame thing, yeah. and this is, goes into the same thing, mm -hmm. it's easy to answer now because so many people in New York City, and I'm a huge New York baseball mm -hmm. fan, are under mm -hmm. this euphoria. I think we're almost under a mist. Like, we're looking at <laughs> Jeter right now, and, and i got to preface this by saying, I know Derek Jeter is awesome, he has this awesome life, and I'm here talking about him. Nevertheless, I'm gonna critique him. <laughs> because we're looking at it with rose-colored glasses. I don't know about When it that. really counted, I'm not sure about that. two nights before he hit that miraculous, but meaningless, <laughs> hit to, to end his career at Yankee Stadium, where Buck Showalter actually should have walked him because mm -hmm. they were still they fighting for a home field against have. the Angels. But that was a classy he move. He created it was. very classy. <laughs> it was move. classy. Two nights before that, when the Yankees still had hope, Jeter came up in the bottom of the ninth to a packed house, down 5-4 with with one man on. And when the Yankees playoff hopes in his last season, he struck out in three pitches, right, guys. Right, right, Sean. I hope you're Sean, right Sean. That. Sean. His last season is not the length and breadth of his legacy. No, no. it's not. No. But I'm just saying rose colored. That's symbolic of what I'm talking about. His championships came basically very early in his career, especially four of them. And I remember watching those games, and he was always leading off starting the rally. He is overappreciated, and guys like Bernie Williams and Paul O'Neill are underappreciated. They contributed much more than he did to those first four, in my opinion. In that, so, right. You're entitled to that you're opinion. To so your opinion I, on that. I think that, you know, in terms of legacy, he's almost looked at as a hero. But to me, guys in the baseball world who the only guys I really regard as heroes are Yankees like Joe DiMaggio, a Red Sox like Ted Williams, guys who actually went to war, a guy like Pat Williams. These guys. <laughs> 
guys are uh, Pat, Pat Tillman. These Pat are guys, Tillman. heroes. Derek Jeter was a great baseball player who owned shortstop for about 20 years, um, and he was great dealing with the media, and he had an awesome resume, resume with the women and dealing with the press. <laughs> oh, yeah. You know? <laughs> That's his legacy in my humble view. And yes, Derek Jeter, if I could be you, I would. Okay. Never wow. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You're entitled to that opinion. You yes. are. Nisa and I may not necessarily agree, but, but you're entitled you're to entitled. it. you're yeah. entitled. Um, so, Jay, where does he rank in the pantheon of all-time Yankee greats? You know, I, I asked this question to a lot of, uh, unlike the people I interviewed, I can't put him in the top five. Because here's, here's the Mount Rushmore, okay? And if you know baseball, without looking through it, as through rose-colored glasses, mm. your, your Mount Rushmore of Yankees is Ruth, Gary, DiMaggio, and Mantle. Okay? Okay. It, that's your top four. D who do you knock off to put Jeter up there? I can't see any of them getting knocked off. Ego number five, to me, it's got to be Yogi Berra, considering the man was one of the biggest pro uh, parts mm. of ten World ten, Series wins. Ten. And okay. Jeter looked like he was going to be heading there. There you go, look, yep. but not yeah, there. He did. So because of that, I can't put Jeter at five. So to me... I don't know. Six, the, maybe? Six. But all of all mm -hmm. the great players who have won, worn the pinstripes in the 50 years since the dynasty ended in 1964, and it's a pretty nice split, 64 mm -hmm. to 2014, I got to go with him. To me, he's the best of those in that era, across that era. And that's, you know, no disrespect to Reggie or any of those guys, or even Williams or O'Neill. Mm -hmm. I put him at six, <coughs> based on the impact he's had on five World Series teams, 12 years as Yankee captain, longest tenure of that yep. in team history. And the fact that, you know what, he may not have been the most dominant player on those teams, Sean, right. but in my humble opinion, he was the most indispensable. I would have to say you're right. I agree right. with you. I agree yeah. with you. I mean, just Captain Clutch. I mean, he got mm, that yeah. name for a reason. He came through in so many big games when he needed to. I mean, the, the fact yeah, that he did absolutely. that actually forced sabermetricians to try and figure out a way to quantify <laughs> clutch hitting. I mean, before that, it didn't really exist. Yeah. <laughs> so, I mean... It, it, to me, there's there's so much there's so much more to I mean, and this is going to sound funny coming from a stack guy, but to me, there's so much more to him and his time in the game and his legacy on and off the field than numbers. I agree with that. Yeah. Thank I, the good Lord for making me a tap the side every time. <laughs> he got it. Well, that music means it's time for the three minute warning. Sean, lead off. Here is my review of replay in baseball. It has made me less of a fan in my favorite sport. This year, I attended six live games. And that's not a bad effort. I balance a night out like all of you, family and work and everything else. And this year, I felt the effect of the average baseball game being longer than three hours. <laughs> baseball is right now setting up a commission to address this. And it's going to be filled with highly paid and educated individuals. People I never get the chance to sit down with. <laughs> but we don't need some elaborate think tank. And I can tell you right here, right now, Replay is taking up an excessive amount of time in the slowest pace of games. Reviews are absolutely intolerable to sit through. And Replay delays unlike a batter calling timeout or a pitcher stepping off the mound just don't jive with the balance and flow of well over a century of development. And I think most fans are finally starting to see that our pastime has lost something by stripping the umpire of his rightful role as the final decision maker. A baseball star who should be remembered. From day one, he never ruffled feathers or stirred the waters. He was classy, dignified, and intelligent. Play the game with the heart of a champion. The quiet fire for excellence and clutch performance burned within, yet he was soft-spoken and loyal to a fault like Ripken and Gwynn. His baseball career came to a close in 2014. Is this Derek Jeter? Not at all. I'm speaking about Paul Konerko, the great Chicago White Sox first baseman. His excellent 18-year career began in 1996. After short, unsuccessful stints with the Dodgers and Reds, Konerko became the model of consistency as a power hitter and defender. His career numbers included 439 home runs, batted over 303 times, 30 or more home runs seven times, 100 or more RBI six times, and he was a World Series champ in 2005, second only to Frank Thomas in his White Sox history in many offensive categories. So the next time when you think of great players, remember baseball's special K. He's Paul Konerko. His career deserves celebration too. How do you sum up Derek Jeter's 20-year career in 60 seconds? Being the resident stat geek, I can give you all the metrics, basic and advanced. 
The basics, he hit 310 in the regular season and 308 in the postseason, 320 in the period between 1996 and 2001, when the Yankees were winning 76% of their postseason games, 93% of their postseason series, and four world titles. The advance, in the five years prior to Jeter becoming a regular, the Yankees averaged 84 wins and only played in one postseason series. In the first five years he was a regular, they averaged 97 wins and won those four World Series titles. I can cite all the signature Jeterian moments. The dive, the flip, the mayor home run, the 2001 World Series homer that spawned the nickname Mr. November, the homer for 3,000, the speech after the last game at the old stadium, all the way up to his final Yankee Stadium hit, a bottom of the ninth game winner. Mr. Roman over here believes that Jeter's legacy is a tad overhyped. I completely disagree. He did it the right way on and off the field for 20 years as the face of baseball's premier franchise and arguably the sport itself. And if that doesn't sum up his career, then maybe this will. If that career was a movie script, you'd probably enjoy the film but wouldn't believe it could ever happen in real life. And yet it did. Michael Phelps arrested for DUI again. Really? Can the Wheaties people afford to get this kid a driver? <laughs> Seriously, though, a first-time DUI offender typically has a much more severe punishment than Phelps had for his first offense. He got probation and a $250 fine, basically a slap on the wrist. Mm -hmm. Perhaps if he had been punished appropriately the first time, there wouldn't have been a second time. Yeah. But I'm also surprised about the more muted reaction to this recent DUI. Outside of a few measly promises by the IOC and U.S. Swimming to investigate, there hasn't been a lot of action, hmm. and there's been virtually zero public outrage. Hmm. If he were an athlete in one of the three major sports, sorry hockey, <laughs> you don't count, then the media would have gone nuts. There would be immediate suspensions and apology tours. Hmm. Is it because he has carte blanche for being our generation's Mark Spitz? Hmm. Or do we just not care because we only care about the Olympics for a couple weeks every four years? <laughs> Is it reverence or apathy? Either way, I hope we get some counseling on making better decisions because that was just stupid of him. Again. <laughs> For Jay Kaplan, Steve Ferguson, and Sean Roman, I'm Misa Petrilli. Thanks for spending part of your evening with us. We'll see you on October 16th for another edition of On the Sports Lines. Remember, if you want to see this show again or catch up on any of the ones you might have missed, check us out at youtube.com slash onthesportslines. And check out our blog at onthesportslines.blogspot.com. Good night, everyone. Good night, Good night everyone. everyone.